Welcome to another weekly featured business brought to you by Visibility Impact and your host, James Moffat, where he will gracefully take our featured guest on a personal and business journey and stories that will inspire, educate, and engage you. Hello and welcome to another Friday Featured Business brought to you by your hosts, myself, James Moffat, and Visibility Impact. Today we have 128 guest, right, all the way from Sweden, but he's not actually Swedish, or maybe he is Swedish as well. So Jan Oberg. So welcome, Jan, to the show. Many thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolute pleasure. So I typically like to have different guests every week. So quite diverse guests uh, are more than welcome. So this is basically a story of their journey from their childhood to where they are now, obviously touching on the the most important parts of their life, any turning points, and also where, where they are now, what they're doing, and why are they doing what they're doing. So without further ado, Jan, the stage is yours. So let's just Find out, first of all, where you are living now and where you're originally from. Well, I came into this world 72 years ago in Aarhus, Denmark, the western part of Denmark, Jutland. And I lived there the first 20 years of my life, roughly, and part a short while in Copenhagen, too, which is more known to people. And then I moved to Lund, Sweden. That's very close to Malmö, if that's rings a bell with someone here. And I went here to uh, study sociology because you could not study sociology in Denmark and I was interested in doing that. So I've been living here the last, what is it, 52 years here in Lund, Sweden, which is an academic town of about 110, 120,000 inhabitants. So uh, as you said in the introduction, I don't know whether I'm Danish or Swedish and I don't bother either. I'm a world citizen, if you will. Absolutely. Likewise. I mean, I am originally from Scotland, lived in England, in the Netherlands, and now in Switzerland. So when people ask me, I have to scratch my head and think, well, what answer do I want to give? But yes, I I mean, we are all world citizens. So I mean, basically, that's the the answer for everyone. I agree. And we should have that. Although touching on it now, that freedom of sovereignty that we can travel anywhere that we wish, because it's our planet is not any given person's planet. It is collectively ours. But anyway, that's a, mm-hmm. a thing that we can talk about later. So yeah, this, sure. this, just for the audience, uh, let, let's just get a little bit of background about who you are. So you mentioned that you, you've lived in Sweden for a number of years now. Now, you also mentioned that you couldn't study psychology in Denmark. Why was that? Sociology. Oh, Sociology. Um- psychology too but it was sociology and well um, the reason was in Aarhus where I grew up there's a wonderful university but it did not have the subject of sociology then I went to Copenhagen University um, and formally it existed but those that was in the in the in the good old days of the youth rebellion and May uh 69 and all that so uh in paris you know everything was chaos you couldn't take an exam you couldn't agree on which books to read you couldn't uh, even um let's say go to lectures there were discussions between positivists and marxists and uh, the whole thing was anarchic i spent two years doing that and decided that either i should spend five more years and go into student uh, academic politics or I should leave and go somewhere else. And there were two places in Scandinavia where you would study sociology, and that was Lund, Sweden, and Oslo, Norway. Uh, Those were the two places where, you know, the textbooks were written and all that. I've always been interested in sociology and social matters. And at the time, my focus was industrial sociology, how people would feel better, thrive in their jobs, motivation psychology and all these kinds of things, management psychology, um, I thought that was what I was going to do in my life, but it w- turned out not to be the case. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it was just that the fact that you said you couldn't study it in Denmark. I thought it was banned or something. Oh, you can't study that. It's a taboo thing. But 
I mean, it just, oh, no, it no, just... no, it was a particular thing for sociology as a study. Actually, um, a year after I left Copenhagen, the Department of Sociology was closed down because of a criminal case. There was a professor who had stolen uh, their money issues or whatever it was. So for 20 years, there was no way you could study sociology in Denmark. And when you do study sociology, is it in a particular language? Well, most of the textbooks would be in English, but we have we have had and we still have very good sociologists in uh, Scandinavia. Right. As you know, we have had philosophers, we have had social scientists, we have had a tradition of peace research, which is where I am today. It's very much Nordic based, not today, but historically. So I assume that you speak and read and write in Danish and Swedish. Yes. Is there a big difference? Uh, there's not a big difference. The, the problem, I mean, in that sense, the, the problem is that um, I, um, I would say the languages are so close to each other that you easily make them, mix them up. I remember I, in the 80s already when I moved over here, I translated one of my books from English to what I thought was Danish. <laughs> my Danish publisher called me up and said, Jan, do you mind if we say that this has been this has been translated from English to Southern Swedish because it's not Danish anymore. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 um, I, I managed to pollute my wife's language also because she's Swedish and she sometimes say, well, I'm not quite sure whether this is a Swedish, a Swedish um, concept or way of expressing it or it's the Danish one. So that's, of course, you don't mix Danish and uh, English, for instance, but it's easy to mix up the Nordic languages with the exception of Finland, which the Finnish yeah. language is completely different. Exactly. I was just going to say Finland because I, I mean, yeah. I've got friends that live in Finland and yeah, no, no, they, they say completely different. They, they say it's actually closer to Hungarian. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, we're not here to talk about languages, although we're we want to talk about something that, that's dear to your heart. So that's just a little bit of background just before we move kind of the, the conversation forward. So I, as a child growing up, I mean, did you have any influences, interests or anything particular that was going to steer your journey to where you are now? Yes, <clears throat> I think you can say I was, I was the child of the Vietnam War. And that made me think. I was, uh, as a young person in high school, I was a member of the conservative youth. And we all thoughtlessly believed that what the U.S. did in Vietnam was, was great. And, uh, I mean, you test your own views when you're in high school, you're 16, 17 and whatever. And then came the youth rebellion, uh, student movement. And then came, um, you know, things like... I switched to a high school where the headmaster, is that what you say in English, the man who runs the school? Yeah. Was Denmark's leading pacifist. His name was Åke Bertelsen. And Åke Bertelsen and his wife had the background that they were the main organizers of the transport of 7,000 Jews from north of Copenhagen to Sweden during the war. And this man was a philosopher. He knew Einstein and Niels Bohr and others. He was a man of, of big theories. And I still remember when he came in and he would say, well, I know we're going to study mathematics and this lesson, but I would much more like to tell you my meeting uh, with Einstein. And then, you know, my ears began to pop out and I said, well, this is damn interesting. So the man was uh, clearly value oriented he looked at the world as one system. He was wrote, wrote several books against nuclear weapons. He was pro-NATO when it started. And that's what I could be too today because NATO's treaty is totally sensible. It's a copy of the UN Charter with added Article 5 that we should help each other if, if one is attacked. Now, that's not what NATO is today, but let's leave that for another uh, set of part of this. But he influenced me very much, I must say. Um, and I think also uh, my father, my father was an art collector and uh, art gallery uh, man. And I worked for him. I was his secretary because he had only six years in school. And he did not speak that much or write English. And, but but the, the world was art, an artist. Uh, and he was a co-founder of the 
of the one of the Danish art academies and things like that. So I grew up in a home in which there was a sense of humanity or something else that, and he hated violence. He was a conservative. We had many struggles and, and, and discussions, but, but he was totally against militarism and warfare and, and violence. So what, what, what led me into peace research was that I took a little course here at Lund University where I studied sociology, and that was a kind of, you know, extra course or something like that. And that was in, in peace and conflict research. Peace and conflict studies, nonviolence, and these kinds of things. There was, um, as we say, it was a five point course. You know, you would study it for four weeks or something like that and write a paper. And that was what clicked with me. And that's where I deviated sociology. I, I am a doctor in sociology, but I, 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 I've done global sociology and not national or industrial sociology as I originally thought I would. So, the, the long story short is I got into uh, to the intellectual academic field of of uh, of academic peace and uh, conflict research which was a subject which was a department at Lund University at the time and his name was Håkan Viberg um, uh, in Nordic countries a very famous man who unfortunately died many years ago but he was my first mentor and the second mentor I ran into um, very interestingly was Johan Galtron um, who was, if you will, one of the definite uh, founders of, for instance, the Institute of Peace Research in Oslo, um, of the Journal of Peace Research, etc. Now, he's 92 now and very frail, but, but he's been my friend since. And actually, he came and gave a lecture at my high school with this Orca Bertelsen. So we met each other in 67, 68. We still do not remember which year it was. We met. He came to my school and lectured. But uh, then my, my teacher here at Lund University said, Jan, why don't you go to Dubrovnik with me in Yugoslavia, what is now Croatia, a beautiful old um, uh, city where, or town where there was an inter-university center, IUC. And that consisted of teachers from 120 universities around the world who came to that beautiful place and discussed philosophy, sociology, uh, theories of science, international relations, peace research, etc. And Johan Galton was the director of that place at the time. That was in 1974. So I got parts of my education in Yugoslavia. And that leads onwards to some of the things we might talk about later on, because the first place we went down as a foundation, for which I'm now the director, was Yugoslavia. And I used to say, if you understand the complexities of Yugoslavia, most other things in this world are, are, are possible to understand. So I got, you know, part of my education in Denmark, part of my education in Sweden, and part of my education in Yugoslavia. Uh, at that time, Yugoslavia, you know, it dissolved in the 90s into uh, bits and pieces. And so um, I took over later on when I had written my dissertation, I took over the Department of Peace Research at Lund University and became the director there for six years from 83 to 89. And that's the end of my story because in 89, the faculty at the Lund University, social, social science faculty decided that, I mean, listen carefully, this is so stupid you wouldn't believe it. We do not want interdisciplinary studies at Lund University. We only want disciplines, you know, sociology here, political science there, law there. We don't want environmental studies. We don't want gender and women's studies. We don't want anthropology. We don't want peace research. We don't want anything that goes across something. And we were an across cultural, cross discipline institution. It was closed down. Wow. It was simply closed down in '89. It was closed down. Even without then, one inter, inter inter academic studies, and the other argument. Would you believe it again? The walls are thick at universities. The other argument was that now the Cold War is over. There's no need to study conflicts and war anymore. <laughs> So I said goodbye. I haven't been to, uh, I've been a freelancer ever since. I've been a visiting professor around the world, but I've not had anything to do with Lund University since then and never had tenure. Right. So you go back to do any talks at universities though or not? 
And well, I've been, I think, since 89, I've given one guest lecture at Lund University. But um, they don't care about knowledge, you know. They care about whether you're part of their institution or another university. I'm part of a private foundation here in Lund. We have absolutely no relations. I'm, I regret that I would have come any time, but uh, c'est la vie, as they say. And, and I, I've been happy that I've not ha been a professor at Lund University. For instance, now Lund University has decided not to have any cooperation with, uh, with Russian scholars because of what happened in Ukraine. You know, I would have left anyhow. Uh, we need to have uh, scientific cooperation and research cooperation with all countries in the world. You don't cut that off for political reasons if you're a decent academic institution. So I've been a visiting professor in Japan and many other places, and that served me very well. I like to do different things. Yeah, it just goes to show that a university doesn't have their autonomy of being independent. They're, they are basically like a government. I mean, there's someone pulling the strings and telling them what they teach, how they teach. And if you deviate from that, then yes. you're not welcome. I would say that was not the case generally in the 80s and 90s, but maybe after 9-11 or whatever, the last 20 years has been more and more politicized in the sense that there are limits to what you can do and say. And I've always um, put a very high emphasis in my own life on being uh, independent and nobody's going to tell me what to say. Okay, so let's just go back to, I mean, you grew up during kind of the Vietnam War and your father was very much into to peace as well. You have a, a sibling as well. I have a brother, yes. Right, and I mean, in the family, I mean, you, you shared kind of the same philosophy on life. I think you can say so, yes. I mean, my brother has been in management uh, studies and written books about um, uh, cooperative management all his life. And we have good discussions, I would say. He very much um, admires and respects what I do, but he's not on the same line, so to speak. But, you know, that's one of the advantages of being for peace and nonviolence. It's very difficult to be against you for that reason. <laughs> No, no, but it, it is, it is, uh, my wife is a doctor in sociology and we are running this foundation together. So yes, my family is, is basically on the same line. Okay. So, even, so, even our dog insists that it's a very peaceful dog. The, <laughs> the problem is when it sees a cat, um, I'm a little bit in doubt about the, how, how deeply that is. But <laughs> Yeah, that's just right. We, we have a, a kitten and yeah, there is one cat in the neighborhood that actually terrorizes all the other cats and <laughs> oh, it, it is terrible i mean that's another story but i'm all for like peace in the way that the cats can play with each other and have fun but obviously it doesn't work either in the animal kingdom either right i think yeah yeah so i'm out uh, there saying peace and like work together but there's always one cat that wants to be the boss Yes, yes. Well, there's a hierarchy in most social systems, so. Yeah, and, and I, I guess as we're part of the animal kingdom as well, there are definitely some animals here that want to be the boss. Yes. Oh, yes. However, if you look at the animal world, nobody has planned to uh, eradicate uh, every other animal. I mean, the idea of nuclearism that humans have uh, have invented is something you would never see in the animal world. There's nobody who's, who's planned or thought of uh, getting rid of everybody else. No, exactly. I mean, they, they, they have a different attitude to why, for instance, you kill for food or whatever it is. But here we kill for, for fun or for money. Exactly. So, so let's kind of move into the subject now. And this is the main reason why we wanted to have you on the show as well, because it is something that's very dear to me. And I think as a child growing up, I mean, I've seen many conflicts and, and wars. I mean, not uh, maybe not being involved in them, but I mean, seeing them as a spectator. Oh, and, yes. And yeah, I, I think a lot of the propaganda that was on TV at the time uh, was kind of pushing the agenda of like, we are the good guys and they must be the bad guys. So let's go and fight them. And everything was about like bringing up as much dirt as you can about them and what they could do to you. 
but they, they just get out there and attack them first. So, but I, I never agreed with wars. And I always thought that I, I missed military service. I mean, in my generation, my in my mum's generation, I mean, there, there was military service. But when I grew up, I, it all stopped. It was kind of voluntary. And I, I just thought, when you're talking about peace, wouldn't it have been good then? Because even in, in Switzerland, they still have military service. You have to do uh, so many years. And, and so on. what about the opposite? What about non-military service in the way that you'd go out there and everybody has to practice peach, uh, peace and do everything humanitarian like for X amount of years. So every year you go off on a, on a week or two weeks and it's all about focusing on what can we do to mm. encourage peace mm. and humanitarian rights and that rather than go out there, like do military maneuvers and everything and be there ready. I mean, it, it's kind of like getting your chess pieces ready because there's going to be a war. So you're propagating that in the way that you're preparing for that. But there yeah. doesn't seem to be anyone preparing for peace. What can we do to stop all of that? So that, that kind of still bothers me in the way that I, I like to think that I'm a peaceful person and I don't want to, everybody's got the freedom mm. to think and, and do as they wish to a certain degree, but as long as it's not affecting me, but I'm, I'm not going to fight people. I want to kind of be the mediator and like, hang on a minute. And that's kind of calm situations down. And I also find that just digressing a bit with my children. Uh, my younger son, he if he sees a fight in the school playground, he's the one that will go in there and then pull the people apart and say, stop <clears throat> fighting, right? Yet there's others that will go in there and say, yeah, get your boot in there, like throw him a, another punch or, or whatever, and making it worse. And <clears throat> I, I just think that, Nothing ever good comes out of a war or conflict, ever. Only for the, the people that profiteer from that. So I, I just wanted to, to see, how did you get into it? I know you've talked about kind of your background a bit, but was there any triggering moment, for triggering probably the wrong word, no? It's an object. Fun well, let me tell you one thing that definitely convinced me when I began to doubt this whole warfare thing and, you know, uh, the Vietnam War and Bob Dylan and uh, Songs for Peace and all that, that, of course, influenced a young mind like me and my um, my uh, headmaster in school, as I said, uh, who was a pacifist. I, I mean... <laughs> I was jokingly thinking uh, to ask you how many hours do we have because you raised so many of the uh, issues that I've worked with uh, throughout my life. To me, the biggest enigma in human history, existence is exactly that. Why don't we come down from the trees and begin to talk with each other instead of doing what we do now and have done for a long time with, among other things, the... the, the uh, image you came up with there's them and us and they are the bad guys the evil ones and we are the good guys i mean that's a plain lie i've never, i've been around i don't know how many conflicts around the world on the ground i interviewed thousands of people in different uh, three thousand people only in yugoslavia three thousand interviews i've never been to a conflict anywhere in the world where you could say all the good guys are on one side and all the bad ones are on the other side I mean, everybody has very often, if we talk about war, have very good arguments for being angry or for feeling threatened. You could, during the 90s, you could sit and have delightful discussions with Croat politicians and with Serbian politicians in different countries, different republics, and they would give you perfectly legitimate, understandable arguments for why they felt that they were threatened by the others, et cetera, et cetera. The, 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 the mistake everybody does due to our civilization, the way we are not brought up with thinking of peace, is to believe that the solution is violence. And here's a very important distinction for me to make, and you mix them up, and that's why I would uh, <laughs> take them up with you. 
there is a huge difference between conflict and violence. All violence is based on some kind of conflict on the line. Exactly like a doctor would say, okay, you have a pain. Where does your pain come from? What is your problem? And that's the conflict, the, uh, the, 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 the root cause of why you have pain. And therefore I said, I love conflicts. We should cherish, we should celebrate our differences and diversities, whether in the family or in the world. We will never be the same. That would be a dictatorship. We have to clash sometimes because we have different opinions, different values, different perspectives on the future, uh, etc. What we must learn to stop doing is to use all the kinds of violence that are available. And it's not only military. It's first of all, individual, physical and psychological violence. It's gender violence. It's cultural violence. It's racism violence. It's all these kinds of things. And there's one thing that I would add to that, and that is structural violence. You know, we live in an individualist culture where we always think that one person is responsible for this war. You know, Yugoslavia was all about President Milosevic. Iraq was all about Saddam Hussein. Uh, Putin is the man who can explain everything. Uh, whatever stupid we do ourselves, it's, it's Putin who is the reason. We live in this individualized Western culture, which is, by the way, declining and will fall. But we could also learn to look at systems as good or bad. There are systems that create war. And the one I point to, and there's not only one because I'm not a fundamentalist, uh, um, is the military, industrial, media, academic complex, MIMAC. It is a system that thrives on warfare with the priesthood of academics and others who can tell you what threatens us and what we must be afraid of and why we must pay more money for the military. It's the scientists. I think still the largest groups of engineers and scientists in the world are those who develop weapons or strategies and strategies for them. And it's the media today. The media, the so-called mainstream media are without exceptions behind war. It's, it's enigmatic to me how much this has become extremism. The media today, and I'm saying mainstream media, I'm not saying all media, I'm saying mainstream, BBC, um, CNN, what have you, my Danish uh, broadcasting system, which I'm in conf constant conflict with, they are all arguing, giving you news, giving you angles, giving you perspectives, interviewing experts who are for war who leads to or legitimate if your country is in war with somebody. And so that's a cluster, that is a structure, that is a society within the society, so to speak. And Eisenhower was the first to take that up in his farewell speech. And he was no dove, you know, he was a military man. Uh, and he said that uh, we have, I have in my farewell speech here to warn the Americans that we have a kind of society inside society. And if we don't, and that was, a, he called it the military industrial complex, it's much broader today. Uh, if we don't get that under control, that something very bad will happen to the United States or something like that. I'm not quoting him directly. And that's exactly where we are today. Since 62, uh, these idiots who are destroying the world in the US and elsewhere with their weapons and their arms trade and their threat images and their um, militarism, as I call it, it all comes together in NATO, is uh, what runs the show. And if you do not have peace education in schools, if you do not have peace journalism, if you do not have peace research at universities, if you do not have peace advisors at the prime minister's office, but you only have lawyers and military people, they are not going to change the day. The world will end at some point. Because peace is a discourse that no longer exists. It doesn't exist in research. I'm a very, very seldom person. I can tell you not to make anything special out of me, but I'm a very seldom person. A professional peace researcher with almost 50 years of experience. 
It doesn't exist in the media. I can't remember the last 20 years to have seen a journalist asking a prime minister, but sir, do you think this will help peace? Or madam, do you think this will help bring about peace in the world that we're now arming Ukraine or something like that? There might be a little skepticism about, about weapon, weaponizing everything, but, but the real peace question, couldn't you do something else like negotiations or dialogues or secret diplomacy or something like that? It's all out. It's a discourse that doesn't exist, doesn't exist in politics, media and research. Now, that is why we are close to the catastrophe. It is a combination of intellectual and moral disarmament the last 20, 30 years. The disappearance of everything called peace. It's, it's a dirty word now in most people's eyes, or it, it's considered unrealistic. On the one hand, and on the other hand, a rampant rearmament everywhere. 2% is now not the ceiling, it's the floor, and blah, blah, blah. These people are intellectually at a very low level. I call that the kakistocracy. I don't know whether you know it's the opposite of aristocracy, but kakistocracy are people who are the least um, fit for their job and the least moral people who are running governments. This is where we are now. And if you ask me, how can I be so arrogant and say so? I can say so because I have, I've watched this trend over almost 50 years, as I told you. I'm 72 now, right? So um, you asked what triggered me. Uh, I, I don't remember whether I said it or not right now, but my military service convinced me completely that I would have nothing to do with it. That was the most stupid experience I've had uh, as a young man. That confirmed my doubts about warfare when I saw how individual, your individual thinking is totally eradicated. Think like a group, don't think, do what is being told to you. That militates about everything in my, in, in, in my personality. So I wrote a letter to the Ministry of Defense in Denmark and said, sorry, but if there's a war and you're trying to call me up, I'm not going to turn up. And the answer was kind of, you know, that was a time when, when you got an answer from an authority or a government, they actually answered you back. And between the lines, it was something like, you know, it's not a great loss for the Danish defense because I was really not a very good soldier anyhow. So long story short, this is, this is to me, uh, uh, intellectually, morally, and otherwise, an absolutely meaningful and very important uh, discussion to have, and we don't have it. The Chinese have a discussion about peace. And my main market media-wise is China today with the Belt and Road Initiative and other things. Because there are people outside the West who found out that the world will not survive if they imitate what the United States and NATO is doing. So, let's just pause there a minute. And yeah, there's a few things that in, in what you said that kind of resonate with me. Well, a lot of it, I mean, and growing up as a kid with peace. How old were you when you did your military service? I was 20. All right. And for how long? 20, sorry, about that. <laughs> and, and sorry, how, how long is it for? That was 12 months. All right. Just but one, I, I, one I time? Should, or? I should tell you, that was really a good one. I wanted to get it finished to start my academic studies. So I said, put me in anywhere. And I came to, what do you call that? The medical troops, the medical units. I was supposed to serve at the infirmaries if there was a war. So I spent only three or four months as a soldier to know how to kill with a bayonet mm -hmm. and how to shoot and how to do exercises and how to operate at night and all that. The rest of the time I spent at hospitals. I spent part three months of... Uh, uh, at, uh, um, at surgery at the Department of Gynecology in Copenhagen's <laughs> University. So if you tell me what you do during your military service, I was assisting in operations uh, of women with cancer in their uterus. <laughs> Quite extraordinary. <laughs> what a difference. <laughs> there was a difference. And I would say that was quite meaningful. What, the other way I could have, but I was not I was not mature for that. And today I'm happy I did it because I know the military system from the inside in that sense. Uh, I could have had civil uh, taken a civil service, as you mentioned before, the conscientious objectors. And that's what I think should be developed in a democracy. People should not be forced to um, uh, or have as the only op opportunity 
to serve the military. You should be able to have a civil service with humanitarian work or social work or whatever uh, and, and say, I do something. You know, ask not what, what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for yeah. your country. Yeah. I think it's great to have a year where you do something for your society, but it's a perversity to force people to do that in the military. That has nothing to do with democracy. No, there, there should be, if you, you can be in the military, training, whatever, or you can be in the Peace Corps, which is that you have to do humanitarian things for 12 months. Yes, yes. Right? And I think uh, that system should develop in a democracy. Because I think if you saw the, the results of a war in a country, then you definitely wouldn't want to, to go back and be in military service. You want to avoid that. But for but, politicians who don't know better, it's a drug. We anyway, do some the issue therefore we send our exactly I mean, this and that but they are the, the the intelligent military people are often very hesitant to what irresponsible politicians do yeah i mean it's just one big rich man's game right so yeah in a way also becoming a poor man's game because there are many people in different societies including the us whose only option is to join the army get a job, get some education, et cetera, and maybe be sent somewhere and earn some money and come back as a veteran, you know. But the I thing mean. is, there's enough wealth in the world to distribute that around everywhere. There's enough wealth purely in Switzerland to have every man, woman, and child on the planet with a nice standard of living. Oh, yeah, yes, that I agree with, yes. But, yes. but is it used for that? No. It will be used to buy the next fighter plane or... Or whatever. I mean, if if you just look in Switzerland as an example, there's military bases all over Switzerland, mm. right? And I think, well, mm. hang on a minute, aren't they supposed to be neutral? Mm. Right? But mm. that, that's another story. But well, you can be, you could be neutral with armament, or you could be neutral without armament. But yeah, but, you know, but I know what it's, you, surely, it's, it's, it's just a I know con contradictory in terms, isn't it? I mean, like, I'm coming there with my muscle because I'm neutral. Surely I come here with my peace and my love. Well, you could say that Sweden had that originally also. Sweden had a pretty strong defense when it was neutral and non-aligned. Now it'll be much more as a NATO member if it gets into NATO. But uh, there was this idea, we've got to defend ourselves from whatever side the attack might come. But you can, you can think, of course, like Costa Rica or Iceland or many island societies, they have no army. I mean, Iceland is a member of NATO. It has no army. Costa Rica has a, a very forceful police uh, force structure. Because but military, and it survives quite well. I think because the way society is that you think, well, if I'm neutral and I don't have any weapons, right, then I'm vulnerable. So I don't want to be vulnerable. So I want to then protect myself in case I'm attacked. So you're thinking on the lines of, that that's the way that the world is, which unfortunately it is like that. But if <laughs> then you have to question, you, you talked about the media, right? The media propagate the wars, right? They, they glorify that, well, having a war is defending us and our, our rights and our freedom and everything else. But so that they've made it through propaganda that it's a good thing. We've got to go and in, invade Iraq. Right, because mm. look at look at what they could do to us. Well, mm. probably nothing, or Absolutely nothing. which is that we make up these stories and we make them up good enough that everybody believes that then we can go and everyone's now flying the flag. Get out there and bomb the hell out of them, right? Because we that's now good. that's why I include the academics in the in the military industrial media academic complex because they are producing these it's university people and think tank people and um, academics at pentagon or whatever who are producing these images of enemies you, you've yeah. seen the last 10 years how it's grown with china china is in no way a threat to the west in no way and i would like to introduce one other distinction that i think is important weapons are no weapons we could have defensive weaponry, not offensive weaponry. The whole thing NATO and everybody else is built on is offensive deterrence. I can kill your people 5,000 kilometers away if you don't do what I say or if you do something I don't like you to do. That can only lead to armament. That's a perpetuum mobile. That is what will get them over there to buy more arms 
and threaten us with, and we say, oh, we are threatened by them, and we are threatened by them, and then you have an arms race. Whereas if, if you imagine a world in which everybody had defensive weaponry, mines along the borders, uh, helicopters instead of fighter aircrafts, etc. And of course, no nuclear weapon because they are by definition offensive. Nobody wants to use nuclear weapons on their own territory. But if we only had systems that would activate the moment somebody did something to our territory or our country, there would not, there would be a kind of defense because we are, you and I in the, in, in the moral or political dilemma that we cannot also put everybody who wants to um, carry weapons, we can't put them in prison like we put uh, conscientious objectors in prison in some countries. So I've been working with military people and others to work out a kind of defensive defense which threatens nobody unless they come and do something back digitally or whatever to our country. And, you know, this idea you have, America has six, 700 bases around the world. It's a perversity. And it is not, it's impossible to build peace on that. And that's why I've recently written a small book, 160 pages, 30 arguments for closing down NATO. Of course, the main thing now being NATO provo provoking, uh, provocative NATO creating the, the the reasons for the wrong action by Putin to invade uh, Ukraine. But <laughs> NATO is definitely a main course if you look at the conflict and not the war. This is not a Russia-Ukraine thing. It is a Russia-NATO thing. And all presidents the last 30 years in Russia have warned against it. And all realpolitik people in the West, from Kissinger and onwards and to little old me, have said years ago, don't try Ukraine, and NATO is totally autistic. But it's built on nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons also against non-nuclear, like conventional attack. And secondly, it's built on long-range offensiveness, the deterrence meaning I can kill any Russian over there or any Chinese, right? If that was totally changed into a defensive UN-acceptable uh, mode of operation, I would not be against it. Because what we have to do is, and that's what most people don't know, Article 1 in the UN Charter says peace shall be established by peaceful means. Peace shall be established by peaceful means. This is the most Gandhian set, sentence ever written, uh, underwritten by all governments in the world. Only in Chapter 7 comes, if you tried everything Diplomatic, diplomacy, negotiations, sanctions, whatever, against somebody who is violating international law, you can take to military means. And those military means shall be guided by the UN and not by the US or NATO. So, you know, we have the normative framework for creating a peaceful world. Well, we have a very weak UN, made weak by member states, and we have very weak secretaries generals. So we are where we are because nobody is defending peace and the UN Charter anymore. Long story yeah. short, I stop here. Yeah. So I agree with that, but <clears throat> also add that my, I always want to know why. Why are we having wars? Why do we have these leaders that don't want to profit, profit, profit from it and also propagate it? Why are the mainstream media pushing for it rather than pushing for peace? So if you start looking at joining some of the dots together, I mean, you mentioned the mainstream media, right? Mm. If you look at them, well, who owns them? So oh, yes. it yes. all goes back to the same source, right? And then what are they involved in and what do they sponsor and pay for and fund and, and whatever? Then they're all connected. And then basically... The people pulling the strings, right, are, are just playing a game, right? And then, I mean, everything is connected. If you take it all the way back to the root cause, I think humanity aren't naturally evil. We are here with love. We, we, we come here in, in peace, basically. We, we want to help one another, serve one another, and pick each other up. And you, you see it if, if someone falls over in the street. We don't ignore them and walk past. Most people don't. You would run and offer assistance and help. That, that's the, the natural humanitarian nature of human beings, right? It's not about fighting <clears throat> and hating each other, but we're influenced by the media, by the TV, by programs, by movies, by 
educational system, by everything. Everything is pushing us towards uh, fighting one another. And we, we get that buzz for it. Even computer games for kids is all about fighting and, and, and winning the battle. I mean, so it's, you're bombarded, it from, bombarded by every angle that growing up, particularly as a kid now, because they're completely confused. They think that if their computer <laughs> game shows that we're winning and they see a, a war going on, then they're, they're going to pick a side. Which side are you on, Russia or the Ukraine kind of thing? <laughs> and then, then, then there's good arguments for one or the other. But we're not ad- addressing the root cause. Why are we doing this and how can we avoid it and stop it? Th- there's not anyone in parliament or a politician that is the, the minister of common sense or the minister of peace, <laughs> right? right? I don't so, think there's a single country that has no. a ministry of peace. But if you look at, I mean, you mentioned like the UN and, and NATO. I- imagine, right, for one minute Russia decides that, I'm going to go to Cuba, be buddy buddies with the Cubans, right? And I'm going to set up there a, a Russian base, right? Right. So or I can. Or Canada. <laughs> yeah. Or wherever, right? Yeah, with Canada, right? How do you think the, the US would react to that? They wouldn't particularly like it. But it's okay to push the NATO forces further and further and further towards Russia. I'm not saying Russia are the good guys either, but I, I'm just saying you're. If you look at it, it, it's a game, a board game that you're playing. It is a, it's a game of chess, right? You're provoking now provocation, and you're, you're getting other countries to, to do what NATO now say. And then if you look at the European Parliament, I've never seen them anything about stopping wars. They're, they're quick to push and get more NATO countries to join in, you know, become part of NATO. And I'm thinking, we're destroying ourselves rather than why exactly. isn't it exactly. you pushing for peace, right? No exactly. more bloody NATO, no more United Nations, no more NGOs that are, are only there for profit. Well, right? I would say don't don't say no more UN because that's the best organization we have. Maybe not as an organization, maybe not, certainly not in terms of budgets because they have no money compared with the military, uh, with the MIMAC. But I would say, yes, we could live a much better life without NATO. You know, NATO has no um, reasons to exist when the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact fell apart in 90. Um, As part of my doctoral dissertation, I went down and interviewed officers in NATO about why they were sitting there and, uh, and what they did. And they were relatively young people. They said, we are sitting here because there is something called uh, the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. And we are here because our parents and we were children uh, ourselves when the Second World War took place. This was in the 70s, I interviewed them. And they said, we are for peace. And I believe they were. They, 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 there are two ways of thinking about how to get to a more peaceful world. But I think what explains to a large extent that this is now not just an element, this militarist thinking that you just outlined and I talked about uh, earlier, it's becoming much more manifest and much more authoritarian and much more the only thing we talk about because the West is on its way down. Militarism is a sign of weakness economic weakness, social weakness, cultural weakness, weakness in persuading others that what you do is good for the world. If you are strong, you don't need the military to back up all your words and policies, Uh, but it looks good with people. The other thing is, I have been, I've been shocked and I've seen a few things in my life. I've been shocked by the last one and a half year, how easy it has been for the propagandists to make ordinary citizens hate Russia, hate Russians, cancel Russia, accept not to read Russian media. That is what is done by the West. It's a violation of a Geneva uh, um, Human Rights Convention of 68, where everybody has a right to freely seek information and form his opinion. You have to have a, a proxy server now to read Russia today or Sputnik because 
they have good journalism and the Westerners are not supposed to see that they have it or they have arguments that you never see in the Western world. And the Western world wants dictatorically as autocratic states to have only one narrative, which is fake, and omit everything that is the other party's viewpoint and omit everything that is about peace or potentials for peace. Now, we are, we are sliding into an autocratic dictatorial situation. And the new secular religion, I'm saying something very provocative now in a Christian culture. The new secular religion is militarism. And NATO is its church. That is the organization where you don't have to argue anything anymore. You don't have even to make an analysis of why China is a threat to the West. You just postulate it. It, on NATO's homepage, I mean, this 160 page thing I did last year about why nature should be closed down is I, I went through everything on NATO's homepage. There is not anywhere a serious, academically defensible argument for why Russia was a huge threat. I mean, Russia, NATO's military expenditures are 12 times higher than Russia's. Russia is a dwarf military. There's a postulate that said they are by different. We have judged that they are. That's not an argument for anything. That's not an argument for four or six percent of the gross national product being used for this. So it's either you believe it or you don't. And the propaganda is there, the media are there to, to keep up your religious faith in militarism. Now, secondly, on that point, because the West is getting weaker, and it is getting weaker. All empires go down. The next empire will be the U.S. empire. There's no discussion about it. And with that, NATO will disappear. When you go down, you have this sense of weakness. And therefore, where you are strongest, though, that is the type of power you use. You're not economically strong anymore compared with others and the rest of the world and the BRICS countries and China and all that. So that's what you do. But you, you, you use military because that's still where the, the West is second to none. And then you expand, expand, expand. NATO's raison d'être today is expansion. And then people say, oh, what do you mean about that? I mean, 10 former Warsaw Pact countries are now NATO members. It, now you have the whole question is, of Ukraine is a consequence of that expansion of 30 years of NATO into Ukraine. And people forget that NATO is not 31 potentially 32 mem members in Europe, because you can only be a member if you're a European country. NATO is now expanding everywhere globally. It has 42 partners, not members, they can't be that, but partners, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, um, partners on all continents. This is NATO, 72, 73 countries that are all in the NATO, if you will, framework. And you ask yourself, this is beyond the rational. This is beyond any kind of analysis. You cannot argue that, you know, you need to be the world's history's strongest alliance with 70 members out of 190 members and then define everybody else as a threat. That is because you're declining. So, and finally, this human hatred is something that has worried me a lot. I thought there would be a peace movement coming up. I had hoped at least there would be a peace movement coming up saying, peace with Ukraine, peace with Russia. Don't do what you do. Russia did something wrong. Yes, we can say that. I, I said that the day after the invasion. It, there were alternatives. But we don't want this. Now you have the left. You have the social democrats. You have a split peace movement. You have a citizenry who accepts this propaganda and don't look through it because it, that propaganda is so massive. I mean, I can just take my neighbors around where I live. Most of them think I'm a Putinist because I think there are two sides to any conflict. A minimum in conflict is two parties and most of them had some views we should listen to. And I am into the question, like the doctor, how do you stop violence only by treating the underlying conflict? You don't treat a patient by a painkiller. You find out where the pain comes from and you maybe do a surgery or something like that. The whole thing is to get deeper and to create peace 
demands much more than creating war. Anybody can start a fight in a bar. Not everybody can stop a fight in a bar. So peace is intellectually, morally, politically much more demanding and the kakistocracy will go for war because any idiot can start a war and continue a war if you have a propaganda apparatus. Yeah, I completely agree. I will send my younger son to the bar. He will stop it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's like we should exhaust every possible means to avoid conflict. Or a, no, a war. To avoid sorry, that. not conflict. Yeah, um, I agree. Conflict is, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going I'm to be a teacher. What, I'm remembering what you said. It's yeah. very important to distinguish. Avoid a war. We need the conflict, as in open discussion. We, we need to discuss why are you feeling like that? Why do you want to attack and, and, <laughs> and cause harm and hardship and destruction? Yeah. Because it's not just inflicted on the opposing country or person. It's also going to affect your people, right? So... I think oh, every, every, every NGO that's involved should be pushing and exhausting every possible means to avoid a war, but they don't. I mean, I, I see that you've just written an article about the G7 in Hiroshima, right? So they're all there. I mean, I wouldn't trust one of them right, with, with my life and my future, not one of them for anything. I mean, and these are supposed to be the, the greatest leaders uh, that are taking humanity right forward. You, you must be joking, right? I, I'd rather be on my own on an island away from them all, right, than, than listen to a single word that any one of them says, because it's all lies and, and fake. I mean, and self-deception, self-deception. They, I think they believe in what they say. Well, of course they believe because they also have their puppet masters as well. So, Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Among them, the military, industrial, media, academic complex. Yes. I mean, if you think that who's making money of any, anything, <clears throat> right? I mean, but what you see, James, is also a lack of vision. There's nothing positive, constructive coming out of the West. There is, we are antagonized with, we are appalled by, we tell others to do this and that, and if they continue, they will see consequences. Where is the vision? America used to be a visionary country. I grew up with a visionary. You know, I grew up in a culture in Europe where everybody looked up to America because they did the new things in music and art and all that, you know. I'm an art collector myself. I have a lot of American art. I work with Americans, some of the America's best scholars. What has gone so wrong is, is, is a question that really bothers me because I've never been anti-West and I've never been anti-America or anything like that. But today, it, it, the Western world is a confrontational structure with no vision. If, if somebody had gone to Hiroshima and said, we are going to present our uh, goals, targets and strategies for a better world 20 years from now. We are going to do some disarmament here. We're going to really put efforts into poverty uh, eradication. We're going to do this and that. We will, you know, there's tons of things you could do. We will engage much more in art and non-material stuff to revitalize our culture. And all. There's not a single constructive thought coming out. And you go to the Chinese media. They are full of ideas. They started 10 years ago, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is human history's largest cooperative project with 140 countries now, investing a hell of a lot of money in it. You know, I'm totally fascinated by this and I'm working with China. I'm going to work in China. Not because I uh, buy everything they do in China. Of course I don't. But because they have a vision. They have an idea of a better world. You know, 30 years ago, I was there in 83. I've seen the poverty. I've seen the dirt. I've been to hospitals where nothing was clean, etc. Today, you have, in many ways, the world's most advanced society. It's happened in, in 40 years. Why, what have we done the last 40 years? We have militarized ourselves in the Western world to death. First, the Soviet Union. That was the Western brother, because one is based on Karl Marx, who was a German. The other one is based on Adam Smith, who was, who was Scottish or British or whatever. Uh, the market and, and communism and liberalism and all that against the other. So the first Western brother disappeared. Now the second Western brother will disappear. And we don't understand a word of China because we come with Western concepts and then we say, oh, they're bad. They're not like us. 
That's actually what you can see in NATO. They are a threat because they are not like us. That's the only argument you're at that low level. So I believe that, that it's, it's truly tragic what the West is doing to itself. Yeah, I agree with that. And I mean, you see it on a daily basis. And I mean, I'm just thinking about the future for my children. I'm mm. struggling enough to try and understand why and what's it all about. And mm. it's the piece. I mean, it, it just reminds me that I, I know you talked about music and songs. Uh, John Lennon was talking <laughs> about imagine and, and give peace a chance and whatever. And, and that was back then. And, and how many conflicts and wars and wars have we had since then? I mean, it, it is, it's just an ongoing thing. And, and, then, lost the, and lost them all morally and politically. Yeah, but, but, but there's ongoing wars that don't seem to make the mainstream media. I mean, like in Israel and Palestine. I mean, this has been an ongoing thing. Yeah, we are led to believe on the Western side that or Israel are right and, and, and get rid of these Palestinians. But then look at it the other way and look at the history. It, it actually reverse. So a lot of the things that we see, we have to invert because it's the wrong way round, And we're led to believe that this is the truth. And in fact, it's a lie. So, but I mean, we could talk about probably most countries in the world and conflicts and wars and atrocities and everything else. But then we'd be here all day. So let's just kind of touch on now some of the publications and other things that you do. So what is it that you do on a day-to-day -day basis? You have some publications. You also, you, you talk also about <laughs> photography, right? Oh, yeah. So, so. Which, which we didn't mention yet. So the, the photography is to do with what you see around the world. And if you could just touch on that a little bit. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, <clears throat> in... 1986, my wife and I set up the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research, TFF, here in London, Sweden, in our private villa. And that's where it has been ever since. And it's a networking organization with about 50 people around the world who are peace researchers, scholars, uh, former diplomats, military people, um, citizens, roughly uh, equally many young and older people. We have some really good old experienced researchers. One of them is over 90. Um, and that's what we do on a website called transnational.live. That's more than 8,000 articles accumulated and now also videos, all having to do with what we are here to do and what I've devoted my life to with my wife and the scholars namely that UN Article 1 provision that peace shall be established by peaceful means. And that, in my view, is the only way humanity can survive in the long run. The risks are too big from, from all, all other kinds of thinking. And that is, of course, a Gandhian thinking. Gandhi always said the means are the goals in the making. If you make, take the right steps every day, you will get to your goal. Don't put up the goal and then, you know, begin to use violence to achieve it faster or something like that. See to it just that you take the right steps, nonviolent steps, and you will get to a peaceful world. And that is absolutely essential in my view. And I don't bother for a second about people who say that's not realistic. The only thing that is definitely known not to be realistic is warfare as a way of solving conflicts. So how so, are you... Now that you've set that up with your wife, I mean, and you have all these publications and everything and followers, how do you influence like politicians or governments or the NGOs? Like, consider peace as an option and let us help you with a kind of a peace movement than, rather than, than default to a war. Well, very much of it is, of course, nowadays the same as it all, as it has been for everybody else. It's the social media, it's uh, press releases, 
It's interviews like sitting here with you or sitting with uh, Chinese national television or whatever. You bring out the message somehow. Um, but let me tell you, I do not focus anymore on politicians and decision makers because I know there's no way of connecting with them. Let me tell you my story. Very quickly, I sat in the Danish government's commission for disarmament and security all the 10 years of the 80s as an expert. I have been an advisor to the Swedish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And, and that was possible in the 80s and 90s. Then I was four years um, non-paid, whatever you call that, goodwill uh, mediator in the Kosovo conflict. I worked with three governments in Belgrade, including uh, President Milosevic. And the civilian nonviolent leadership of Kosovo under Dr. Ibrahim Rugova, who wanted an independent state by, by nonviolent means. Now, so I've been into politics. I've been in situations where politicians listen to me as a peace researcher. That is not the case anymore. You can send out anything. And the same goes for the media. Let me add that. I was a very often used media person, expert on Yugoslavia or whatever in the 90s in the Danish and Swedish press. Nobody has called me the last 20 years. So this idea, you know, you send a letter to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and you hope you influence somebody that, no. The, the thing that will change the world is critical mass among citizens and some experts and some philosophers and some intellectuals. <clears throat> but trying to get the ear of decision makers today who, are, as I said, are kakistocrats, kakistocrats, <laughs> will be very difficult. I have given up on it. I don't think that they read, maybe they read what I say, but they certainly never react to it or they don't say, you know, come over, let's have a talk at, our, at my office. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a special person who should be invited to, but I'm just telling you there is no communication, whereas there was communication before, uh, let's say uh, up to 40 years ago. So, what we influence, I think, is people around the world who are ordinary citizens in the good sense of the word, who are curious, who are concerned about life uh, and the future for, as you said, your children or my grandchildren. We influence, of course, a, quite a few alternative independent journalist minds. And, you know, there are always somebody who listens to what you say, but it's not the prime minister or foreign minister of Sweden or Denmark. That, that, that would be naive to believe for me. And if they read me, it's to see how crazy I am. You know, that's, uh, I, I get small signals here and there that says Jan Oberg has, you know, he's writing for the state media in China. That means he's a completely unreliable idiot who doesn't know anything. You know, that's, that's, we are at that level, right? And they can stand, of course, that I am very frequently on media everywhere else but in the West. That's something I have thought, uh, tried to be, but something that has developed over time. There is a great will to listen to peace elsewhere, but not in the Western mainstream world. So I don't try to do that. I don't try. So what we do is, of course, and, you know, I've been a visiting professor five times in Japan. I've been a visiting professor in different European countries. I've been in Burundi for 10 years. Um, I've been teaching, giving guest lectures, etc. And of course, what, what I think I have or hope I have done over my life is to influence also students' way of thinking. Because if you take a course with me, you will not get a positive view of militarism. <laughs> you get a critical view of militarism. And some might say, well, that's not neutral. That's not a professor's job. But if you're in peace research, if you're a peace academic, your job is to reduce violence as the job of a doctor is to reduce diseases. Yeah. This is a value-oriented academic uh, endeavor, not like perhaps political science or international relation, who say they are neutral, but always end up supporting the militarist forces. So long story short, we have preserved our independence um, we used to get a very small, like $40,000 a year in the 90s. But when I had spent three years, four years as, an, as a mediator and in Kosovo and NATO decided to bomb, 
we lost the support of the Swedish government. We knew too much. And we were out all over the place, CNN, BBC, etc., saying, don't bomb Yugoslavia. It will not solve the conflict with Kosovo. We were quite good at getting through that one to the media, also to the mainstream at the time. This was 99. But three months later, we got a letter saying, unfortunately, we cannot support you anymore from the Swedish government. So I have known all the time there are no money without strings attached. So, so, how, do we, so how do we run the foundation? It is paid for exclusively by ordinary citizens. $5 a month from a lot of people. And secondly, none of us, neither my wife nor I, nor any of the 50 associates of our foundation has ever been paid for what we do. We're totally volunteers. I earn my money in different okay. ways. Uh, it, it just baffles me. I, I mean, I, I'm thinking peace, humanity, quality of life, well-being, sovereignty, freedom. And there should be no price is too much to pay for bringing <laughs> that. Yeah, you're, as I said, the, the governments are quick to invest in the, the new fighter plane, which will cost billions. They're, they're tanks and things that will never be used. And all of this, but they will not invest in prevention. Uh, it, it's kind of protection, just in case we need it, in case we're invaded. And I think, well, you shouldn't even be thinking that. You should be thinking that, what can we do to help people? I mean, if Switzerland, I mean, I, I just say Switzerland because I live here. I mean, mm -hmm. so neutral. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they the peacekeeping country of the world and they go around the world and saying that uh, we have to like give peace a chance we excuse the pun but we have to go out there and do everything we possibly can to yes to, right. to, yeah. to stop to, to stop these wars yes. and, and yeah. have healthy d discussions i mean what is like as you said the doctor patient analogy what is the pain that's causing you that is it getting worse how can we stop that pain uh, how can we bring these two leaders together? Who are obviously not leaders because they're just dictators or bad bosses. How can we bring them together to, to sort out the differences and put them, if they really want to do it, put them in a boxing ring and say, fight it out. <coughs> Don't let the people suffer because they, you end up innocent people, like brothers, husbands, sons and whatever, going out to war to fight the opposite that they, they don't want to fight either. And you have a problem here. The problem is, James, that over the years, everybody who knew something about peace have been thrown out from these decision-making circles. If, if, if a good-hearted European leader would say, let's, and I don't want to mention any names, but let's say a leader say, now we can't continue this policy against Russia. We cannot keep on arming Ukraine. We must find a solution to Ukraine's security in the future. Where should he or she turn? There's no experts around him or her. There's no research institute to turn to. There's no uh, uh, army of professional mediators who, of course, they could do it if they existed. This is our this is our job. But where would such a leader go? He would ask some military people. He would ask some lawyers, and he would ask some maybe some uh, diplomats, and he would he would he would get no answer as to what should the first step be, how do we do mediation and all that. We're totally illiterate when it comes to peace and conflict resolution, but we are very highly developed when it comes to militarism and beating each other up. Yeah. And that's why I think, you know, we have done ourselves great disservice because the knowledge is it's not, I mean, these politicians are not evil people. They brought themselves into over time and generations into a situation in which they from which they cannot get out. They are prisoners of militarism. And if that's the only thing you know, then you go for more militarism. It's completely like a drug addict. I know it is or an alcoholic. It destroys my body if I continue to do this, but I can't do anything else. And there's nobody I can turn to who could help me getting out of my dependency on these weapons and military talk and um, demonizing the other side and seeing myself as better than them and all that. It's, yeah. it's into the system. And that's why I say there's only one way out of this. And that is that the people who pay for all this, and they all know it is paid for by taxpayers, 
would rise and say, you have never given us the security you promised. Look at NATO. It has worked since 49, saying it would create peace. And now it's the biggest single organization for warfare. I'm not going to pay. I would like to have, a, a, what do you call that? The strike of taxpayers, taxpayers refusing to pay the percentage of their of their taxes that goes to the military. It would be about 60% in the US or something like that, you know? So, so do you that would be fantastic if we could have the, the, a popular protest of common sense, as you mentioned before, saying, we're not going to finance this anymore because it is financed by people, unfortunately. So I nominate myself as a global common sense minister for the world. Right? <laughs> to bring yeah. peace and common sense and freedom to everybody, right? And I, 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 it just bothers me, right, that, I mean, you've done something that is human, humanitarian correct and how we should be as humans, that this is our nature to be peaceful and loving and sharing and giving and compassionate, empathetic and supportive of each other. Let's say, James, not only people are willing, in some cases, to do terrible things, we probably have, as human beings, the ability to do both. And that's where my suggestion is very clear. Don't try to change human nature if it has both the aggressive and the peaceful, loving uh, aspects. Change society in such a way that you bring out the best in people. You know, that's a hell of a difference because if you operate, I'm not saying you and your James, but I'm saying if people operate with the belief that everybody is evil, then they justify for themselves to do more evil to keep that evil down. You know, lots of people have, after lectures have asked me, but Jan, don't you think that human nature is evil? I said, I don't think it's only evil. It may have the ability to do evil, but we could channel that into also doing good, which yeah. people do. I mean, they love their children and they do beautiful things and they do art and all that. And then I used to say to that person on the first row saying, Jan, don't you think that we are evil? I said, are you evil, madam? Or are you evil, sir? And I have yet to find a person who says, yes, I know I am evil. So, you know, all this is bullshit theory. Mm -hmm. Whether you locate this with, with, uh, etheologists to think that we are all animals and animals, as I said, are not only evil or doing bad and vile and aggressive things. Or you go to Conrad Lawrence or something like that. But you can go to book, good books like Eric Fromm and others who, who have a balanced view of we have the ability to do very evil things, but we also yeah. have the other side. And we, yeah. the only, we can't change human nature in, a, in, in foreseeable future. We can change society so that we get the best sides out. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I... I agree. The, the thing is, we're born in a kind of a duality in the way that we have an ego. We have an ego that, that can do things for the better or the worse for humanity. So we're, wherever, I mean, you said there's a balance. Wherever there's a yin, there's a yang, a right or a left, a, a good or a bad. Now, we have the choice. We have the choice. We, we could do spend the rest of our lives doing wonderful, great, magical things for humanity, but, but we yes. also have the choice that we could do the complete opposite. And maybe yes. sometimes we do some bad things, but then we can do some good things as well. So there's a balance. And you also have to decide within yourself, like, am I doing, is that really necessary? Is it really bad? And is it causing hardship? And I always say to my kids, wherever there's an action, there's a reaction. Do you want the reaction to be something good or do you want it to be bad? Like teasing at school. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I, my son was teased by a girl in his class, constantly teased, right? He can't play and win at her game because she's a master teaser, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, walk away. Mm -hmm. But he retaliates and his reaction was spotted by the teacher. So he's the bad guy. But yes. he reacted to an action that he couldn't have, he couldn't win because she's the master of it, right? So I, I just think that in every situation... <laughs> the, po the Putin and the girl, the NATO. <laughs> but it, you do, you take it to... You can picture it on a smaller scale like if you use your kids as an example. But if you look at it on a country level, right, 
there's an action, there's going to be a reaction. Someone said something against your government or your people or the way of life or that you're Western and you eat too many McDonald's or, or whatever, right? Right? Then, oh, we don't like that. We don't like what you said, so we're going to react to that. Now, so was it provocation at the beginning that made you act like you did? But what exact what reaction are you expecting? A good one or a, or a bad one? There are two words that I always combine, and that is projection and provocation. Mm -hmm. Two pros. I mean, if you provoke somebody sufficiently long, where does it come from? It comes from projecting your own dark sides, if we're talking psychology. Mm -hmm. The West is now projecting its own dark sides on everybody else. They are bad because we know we are bad. We're doing wrong things. And so you provoke somebody, you provoke Russia for 30 years, you provoke China now, and you hope some kind of reaction, because if there is a little reaction you can interpret as something really bad, then you have justified your projection and you can ask for more money for the military. So I would say NATO is in the business of provocation to keep alive. If it doesn't provoke, it cannot find threat enemies and it cannot argue for higher levels of military yeah. expenditures. So it's, again, a perpetual mobile. We okay. should not forget to talk about photography. It's very dear to me. Yeah, we, we will. Let's just conclude. I mean, you're right. But if you look back in, in history and in hindsight and in the results, I mean, a, a lot of this provocation and everything, like the, the weapons of mass destruction that never existed, yeah, you had that as an excuse to invade a country. And but what was the repercussions of that? Was anybody held accountable? No, they, they got off as free people to carry on doing their dirty work, right? So the justice system doesn't work either. So whoever it is like looking and think, right, we're now we've got all the facts and everything, we've got the evidence, and right, maybe we didn't have it at the time, but we have it now. Right. That was a, a war crime, but nobody's held accountable. Exactly. And you could say also, yes, of course, there's somebody, uh, a president of a country who is uh, formally accountable. But you can also say it's a system that operates. And how do you punish? How do you put a system in prison? The only thing you can do is politically to see to it that it doesn't exist. Yeah, change the system. Change the system. That is the best punishment. Right. Exactly. So anyway, uh, Maybe for any of our guests that they, if you've got any questions before we just touch on your photography and then we'll kind of wrap this up. Uh, Rowena or Carmen, any questions? No, I don't have any um, questions, but I, you know, I really fully agree with what, what he's been saying. And it's just, you know, it's just good to hear that someone's out there um, fighting the, the good fight because I mean, it is incredible. Um, I mean, I, I just don't understand. They're always talking about this war war in Ukraine, but there's just never been any talk of peace on the um, on the mainstream media. Um, so, which has just, you know, just shocked me, um, you know, and I can see it for what it is for me. It's a NATO aggression um, against Russia. And I think Russia's in there. There, you know, Ukraine had never established their borders, um, and they were NATO was helping them to build weapons factories and um, bioweapons factories, and um, you know all this nuclear um, capability on the border with with Russia, and Russia is just policing it. Um, and I mean, I just don't know. You know, it's, if if we had wars in the past as well, we used to have daily weekly reports of what's going on and we don't hear anything so i just i don't believe in it at all and i just you know i'm just i just wish there was you know something on the mainstream media came out about like starting to work for peace but thank you it's been absolutely fascinating <laughs> thank you Rana. yeah thanks for that. Uh, carmen I, I know i'm not sure if if you've got anything any questions Hi, sorry, James. I've been just working and listening. I don't have any questions, but it's, you know, great to 
to hear other people and like-minded because I think we all agree on, you know, general things that we're talking. So uh, happy to be here. Just listening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right. So thank you for that. So let's just touch on your photography and if there's any, and then we'll, I mean, at the end of this, we'll make all the links and everything available so people can reach out, they can follow what you're doing and yeah, the photography. So just tell us a bit about that. Well, I think I told you long ago in this conversation, I grew up in a home with art, um, literally speaking. I was crawling around the floor among ceramic vases and uh, seeing paintings on the walls and all that. And many of the people who came and visited my parents were artists. Now, what set me off concretely opening uh, parts of our house as a gallery and studio was when I found out after my visits to uh, fact-finding missions to Iraq that I wrote a lot of stuff, academic stuff, analysis of what people had told me in Iraq. I made some 160 interviews with also very high-level people close to Saddam Hussein in uh, 2002 and 2003, if two weeks before the invasion. I found out that these articles, of course, were read on, on transnational.live, uh, but what people really reacted to were my photos from Iraq. You know, kind of, we have a seminar here in California. May we blow up your pictures on the wall while we have the seminar and stuff like that. And people say, it's so amazing, these children and others and people in um, cafes with sitting smoking and the humanity of the Iraqi uh, people. We've only seen pictures of Saddam Hussein shooting in the air and being at military parades. You are giving a completely different uh, uh, impression of what Iraq is and the beauty of the place also. So that gave me a thought. The other thing that has given me a thought is, of course, and I say that with regret as an academic, people read much less than they watch pictures now. I mean, a lot of stuff is now done on, on Twitter-like statements, you know, and then some pictures and uh, smart websites and all that. So there's no, YouTube and all that didn't exist at the time. There's no way to deny, if, even if I prefer writing as a way of communicating and influencing people, and I've done many, many thousand pages over my life, um, that pictures are important. So... I started out with a mixture, and that's what it still is today. It's not documentary, basically. I have some documentary from Aleppo, for instance, because I was one of the very few people who was in Aleppo when it was liberated in December, on December 12, 16. And I do have other things such as Iraq, etc. And I have some documentary also from Burundi, where I have worked for 10 years. But what I call it is photographics. And photographics is not photography. It is works that are artistic in some kind of way. Well, people can judge that, but that's what I think it is. It's not fashion or something like that. It's art, photography, collages and stuff uh, printed on matte papers and appearing more like a piece of graphic art rather than, you know, black and white uh, glossy uh, photography. So I call it photographics. And I do it also because I needed something else in my life than the rational, political, uphill work. I, I wouldn't say I need, need it for recharging my batteries and things like that, but it, it's, you know, walking on two legs. I have an academic leg with all the credentials there, and then I have a spontaneous leg is photograph photographics which I have not taken a single hour of instruction in. Whatever I know about art is from, you know, 70 years of watching art wherever I go in the world. Uh, by the way, next week going to the Art Basel uh, is something that I have, that is my education, so to speak. And so I have a homepage, uh, oberkphotographics.com. And people can see very diverse photography. One of the things I've avoided, which I think most people who are, you know, professionally educated in is I can do things I like to do. I, I don't have a style. I think having no style is a style. 
So if you look at something by me, you might say, well, is that the same person who's made, made these things? And the answer is yes. Now, what I'm proud to say is I was invited to the European Cultural Center in Venice in 2019 for the Biennale. You know, that's the world's most uh, important um, event for contemporary art. And I made an installation which is called SPAR, Silk Piece Art Road. And that is a, four big panels and multimedia and um, video screens and calligraphy and stuff that I'd collected in China when I traveled around there in uh, 2019, uh, 2018. And that is about the change of the world order. It goes from war to peace. It goes from dark colors to light colors. It goes from, if you will, the Orient to the uh, Orient. And it was seen by 300,000 people in Venice. And part of the time I stayed there, most artists leave or they have other exhibitions, so they're not there. But I stayed there and I talked with about 1,500 people about the future of the world. And so that installation is not only a piece of art or in an installation, it is a drop back or it's an occasion to deal with what do I fear about the future? What do I think about the future? Where will we be in 20 years from now, etc.? And, you know, to Venice comes people from all over the world. There's no country that some art lover is not coming from. So it was absolutely fascinating. Now, then came the COVID. But the idea was at that time that it should go to China. So finally, I have a green light now. It's going to China. It's going to tour around in China, being shown. I will be there myself, dialoguing with people to my best extent. I don't speak Chinese. And I will create art pieces together with Chinese uh, art students or artists. And my great inspiration and my favorite artist is Robert Rauschenberg. And Robert Rauschenberg did um, a project in the 80s, which is called, he called Rauschenberg's Overseas Cultural Interchange, Roki, or Rosi. And it was exactly, he traveled around the world um, and he did art together with people where he was. And you can see now he was in China, now he was in Bolivia or whatever it was. And you can see how how it was still Rauschenberg, but it was a different Rauschenberg from place to place. But his idea was to promote human rights, uh, dialogue and peace. And I can say that's my absolute, uh, the most important inspiration. I'm not a Rauschenberg, but I can take inspiration from him and Gandhi and others and say, maybe I can reach some people through pictures that I can't read with long texts about things. So... That's why it gives me joy uh, to, to do these things, um, because they are kind of connected. It's different faculties I use, but they serve the same purpose. I wouldn't say all my pictures are made for peace. That, I mean, I hate, I hate uh, any kind of, you know, doves and all that, you know, peace symbols. and all. I think it's terribly boring. Uh, but if, if it gives people an experience and make them think about our situation, I'm happy, but I'm not doing peace art, for God's sake. That's the last thing I would do. Like I also think that everybody who did all these war monuments, etc., cetera, are doing bad art. Art that wants to promote a particular message are usually not very good art. It has to come from your heart and not with a political point. But if it can speak to people politically, there is, there is there, in the receiver's mind, I think that's that's great. So I can't wait to get to uh, to China and show it. The first place will be Nanjing. And Nanjing was a former capital. Uh, Nanjing is also the peace city of China. And one of the reasons is that that was where the Nanjing massacre took place in the 36, 37 with the Japanese occupation. So that's also one of the few places where there, as far as I've understood, I haven't been there yet, uh, is academic peace research taught at the university. So if I could show an exhibition, have dialogue with people there, do art with Chinese students uh, or artists, and give a couple of guest lectures, you know, that's my dream future. And then it will travel back through the capitals of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's a, two, three, four years project. I have no idea how to finance it yet, but um, it will be. It, it will kind of, you know, develop its own energy. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. So that, that's what I do. But 
I, I like what you mentioned about the art. I mean, you can see all these peace movements and the photos are there. That peace movement is just that movement for that day. If When you talked about being uh, in Iraq and, and you took a picture of people in, in a, maybe sitting outside a, a, a cafe smoking and drinking coffee, that is a real day occurrence that would happen every day. And that to me is more meaningful because you could show a picture of that. That was the day before the bombing. And this is the day after the, the cafe is no longer there and, mm. and, and whatever. And then it makes you think that like, why did we spoil this balance of something that was so beautiful and destroyed it? And so you're right. I mean, they say a picture says a thousand words, a picture like that would actually get you thinking that, why have you taken something that was so beautiful on everyday life and destroyed it? Right. And remember, James, those are the pictures you don't see in the mainstream media. Exactly. There you see, you know, uh, pictures, portraits of people we should hate. And then you see military people and you see the destruction. You mm -hmm. don't see the ordinary citizens. I mean, have you, have you ever seen a report about how ordinary citizens in Japan or Russia lives on CNN or BBC? No. Because they would give sympathy. They, then people would begin, oh, my God, are we going to bomb these people? They look so beautiful. Why, do, why, would, why would we? But if somebody puts up a picture of, of Xi Jinping or Putin, a lot of people would say, yeah, 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 that's good. Yeah, so exactly. I, I mean, that, is, that is why pictures are also very seductive and very dangerous. Not only the text, but the pictures too. I pictures mean, help us make war. Exactly. I, if you think about... I mean, using kind of stealth drones now that, that can drop bombs on people. I mean, you're in a busy, bustling high street. And next and everybody's like bartering and trading and going about their daily lives. So the next minute, a minute later, complete destruction. You didn't see it coming. And yeah, I mean, it, it's shocking. But where do we hear these stories? We just hear about oh, yeah, a bomb strike or, or, or whatever, and someone's pushed a button and been able to, to massacre 100 people right? just at the push of a button, and nobody cares. Right? And probably, you know, that carries over from war games, etc. There are people who have been in these planes and have done these things, and they say, well, there was not much of a difference. Yeah, exactly. We, we no would different... think there was a target of people walking down there and we, it's boom, it's... we took them out, right? We took them it's out. Like, it's like a, 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 like a, a virtual reality computer game. That you're not yeah. really there and it's not really you. You're not on the ground fighting. You're just there in a virtual reality. You don't even see what you're doing. You just no, but that's that's exactly what I think is is they, these people are living, if you will, in their own world. It's not the real world. It's not the world that you and I live in. No, but they are living in a fantasy world of demons and and people we must eradicate. And of course, there's a Christian message: if you're not with us, you're against us, and you have to be like us and all that. Which, by the way, the Chinese don't have in their genes. There's no idea that everybody should become Chinese or have one party systems around the world in the Chinese thinking. The Chinese and the Japanese want to be specific and not turn everybody into with mission work to into a copies of themselves. So I think that that's, that's one of the um, <laughs> living in a world outside the world you and I perceive, including the beauty of what is destroyed. I've been to these war, war zones, you know, tons of them around the world, worked in them, um, been arrested, uh, shot at, and God knows what. And it, it's amazing to me that the only people I can respect in these uh, war uh, theaters, as it's called, which is a strange word, uh, have been the UN peacekeepers. Yeah. They're decent people. They're decent sure. people. They're professional people. And they're not paid to be uh, strong. They don't have good mandates. They have weird mandates. And then, of course, if some country says, well, you've done enough here now, we don't want you to be here then anymore, then you don't pay them anymore. That was happened. That was what happened in Srebrenica in Bosnia with the, with the massacre. So when you went and to so all these... It's, 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 there's so many, and that's a, an interesting thing also, there are many things people do and show their goodness. We talked about evil and goodness mm -hmm. of human nature. I've seen so much goodness in war zones. 
people yeah. helping each other, saying we don't follow the, the governments. If the little old lady needs to get to a hospital and she belongs to the other side, I'll take her there. You see what I mean? That there's, there, people sometimes have asked me, how, how, do you, how, how have you been standing? How, 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 how have you felt working in war zones and seen a lot of bad things? And I say, well, I see two things. I see, I see evil and I see good. There is absolutely many good people. I've had peace courses with, with young people from two different groups, Serbs and Croats in, in Vukova. And it's some of the most rewarding things I've ever done because they found out that they did not need to hate each other because their parents had hated each other or because they hated each other during the Second World War. And there's a lot of goodness around if we could get just channeling it out. It's no, much I, stronger than the evil of this world. No, absolutely. I mean, I, for work, I had the opportunity to go to Israel many times. And mm -hmm. I, I'm talking to kind of regular Israelis and and, and, and they say that it is terrible. It's evil what's happening between Israel and Palestine. They don't want anything to do it. And a lot of them have Palestinian friends. And, and they say that, yeah, we just want to live a life together. But we are powerless because of the governments and, and the, the system. And, and so they're already labeled that they're the perpetrators. And maybe some are. But there's a lot of very good people that don't want any of that. And so it just leaves me the question, just as we wrap up, like when you go to these war-torn countries, and are you going as part of the UN? Are you going independently? And do you wear something that identifies you as like a peace, <laughs> a peace keeper or, or what? No, I've never gone anywhere. My teams from TFF, from our foundation, and I have always gone there as private persons. And we have, when it was Yugoslavia, we rented a car, a white car that looked like the UN, but it didn't say UN on it. And we negotiated our way through the different checkpoints. And of course, could speak about who we were going to see and mention a minister here or a mayor there or whatever. And we usually got through with these things, but we've never been part of it. I have worked a lot with the UN, such as doing courses for the UN in, in former Yugoslavia. Um, and of course, interviewed them because they know a lot that you don't see in the media. But I have always been independent. And of course, that has been risky sometimes, but it's gone well, um, generally yeah. speaking. Yeah. You don't have a jacket like with that. I mean, well, you have press I mean, and you have. I mean, a peace. jacket for protection. Yes, we've we've had to carry it in, in some. No, not with the because sign. It is, it is dangerous. It's like when you see a journalist standing somewhere in a war zone. You have to protect yourself. But okay, but no, but it not has with, not been. Uh, it has not been like protection by by being part of an organization. We've been the transnational foundation, uh, and that was actually an interesting experience because we were not journalists. We were not diplomats. We were not the. UN. And most of these places where you negotiate through a checkpoint uh, to get on to the place where you're going to get in the war zone, they say, OK, go through. We don't know who you are, you know, in the sense that they can't place us. If we had been journalists, they would say, where's your where's your card? You know, you have no right to go. But we say, well, we, we're meeting with this and that high level person there. And so maybe it was not true, but we, we got through these things. You know, that's how I did 3000 interviews in former Yugoslavia, yeah. solution wars. But you don't have like on your jacket. I mean, as I said, that you can have press, you can have UN, you can have whatever. You no, don't have peace. We bought neutral, <laughs> neutral um, uh, flag jackets. And in one case, we were advised by the local military militia that uh, you better sit them on them in the car because the greatest risk for you is that you drive on a on a mine. So better have them <laughs> sit them on them than having them elsewhere. <laughs> so, you know, there's been many funny stories, but I'm not a war hero in any way. But and, okay. and it's not fascinating. I've never written about it. I may never do it. It's not the important. The, what I'm proud of is that we've helped quite a few people here and there to live together again and not hate each other. Exactly. So, and th this kind of, you know, I was a hero. We were arrested. Uh, we were shot at. And it's, not, it's not interesting to me. It's part of the job. Exactly. So... Jan, you've been an absolutely fantastic guest. Our hundred and twenty, <laughs> our hundred and twenty-eighth guest. So it could have been being a terrific uh, interviewer. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I, I think 
we just keep this easy going. I mean, we have people join if they wish and to, to hear the live show. Uh, and then we have the recording that goes out to the public later. Yeah. So, but yeah. yeah, you've been absolutely fantastic. And uh, I mean, we, we could talk on any of these points for hours. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have true. we have gone over a, a lot of the time that we allocated for this, but <laughs> it's, it's been very interesting. And have you got any kind of closing? We will make kind of all the, the links that you've already provided me with. I'll make them available in the in the show Thank notes you. so people can, can click on them and look at your photography <clears> and, <throat> and the work, the excellent work that you're doing. But have you got any kind of closing uh, remarks or a, a closing statement that you want to give? Uh, and then I'm oh. just going to ask Rowana, I, I, maybe you have something as well you want to say before we, we just go. No, I would, I would just express my gratitude for, for the way you do a program and the way you connect with me and let me uh, let me tell what I'm doing. Of course, that has to do with also not being a three-minute thing that I'm usually doing. Um, I really appreciate that uh, and what you can do by your program in, in broadening out the peace methods that my foundation and my colleagues are trying to promote. I usually end everything I say, lectures, whatever it is, with a quotation by George Bernard Shaw, uh, which is very dear to me. And I could quote Gandhi too, but in this case, George Bernard Shaw. Most people look at the world as it is and ask why. Why is it so painful? Why is it so violent? What we should do is to look at the world as it could be and ask why not. And that to me is what peace research is about. I've always said you do three things. You do empirical analysis of the reality. You criticize what you see when it's too violent. And three, you come up with treatment. It's diagnosis, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. You're a bad researcher if you cannot say something about how to solve the problem you have described. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to also talk about how we could see the world. That's beautiful. I, I, I want to add to that, but Rowana? I absolutely love that quote because this is what I'm doing with food and nutrition and what we're putting in and uh -huh. on our bodies because I have been studying... But I changed my eating habits about 10 years ago, but I've been studying since then ways why why are we getting sick? Um, what's making us sick? And then I've I've been looking, I've found solutions, you know. So I, you know, I I sort of look at the food chain, look at what's wrong with it, but then look at how we can actually change it to help ourselves and um inspire I, you know, my I created a course to inspire people to understand what we're putting in and on our bodies, the impact, and then how we can make a, a permanent positive change. And it doesn't just look at food. It looks at lifestyle. It looks at psychology of, mm. of um, everything. So it's just, it's exactly what you said. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've done the research um, and I've um, criticised it and analysed it and now I've come up with a solution. And now I just need to, just need to sell it to people. <laughs> and you can't leave solutions to politicians that much we know by now. No, and you can't leave it to doctors either because they're just... <laughs> they seem to be Medical industrial complex. <laughs> yeah, because for me, it's, you, can't, you have to go to the root of any issue um, and not just throw uh, solutions, um, not just throw things at symptoms. So, in a good democracy, everybody knows that they have to do things themselves, not wait yeah. for politicians to do it. But that's the curse of the representative democracy. We go and vote every four years and then we get something else at what we want. It's not democracy anymore in the West. Yeah, exactly. Thank so, you. Uh, I, I would like to just add that we manifest what we believe in. So if we are looking at all the negativity and and kind of all the, the bad news on TV mm. and everywhere else, then our mindset is already in that kind of anger and frustration and that doom and gloom. Now, we look at what do we want? Where do we want to go? Because that's when we start to manifest what we do want and, and how life should be and focus on that. Because if the universe answers us, well, it will bring us closer to that rather than 
and go through life in a negative doom and gloom mentality. So anyway. I always believed working for peace is, should be convivial. It should be also fun. I wouldn't do it if I didn't have a good time doing it. I tell you, I'm not a Mother Teresa. I'll never be, by the way. But uh, it it is very rewarding intellectually and morally, although you don't get the millions uh, of support, you know, because you're doing the right thing every day. That's not yeah. a bad thing. Exactly. So on that note, I thank you once again for being a great guest. And thank you so sharing, much. Sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it's been excellent. Okay. Have a great weekend. Great. Okay. Well, you too. Have a okay. great work with this, with this interview and shortening it. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, friends. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That was another featured business brought to you by Visibility Impact. If you'd like to be our next featured guest or learn how James Mofat can help you leverage on the art and power of interactive storytelling for your business, reach out and schedule a call now. 